morning congregation and welcome to worship this morning. As a call to worship this morning, I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Let us pray together. We praise you, Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today and forever, that you are our solid rock, our fortress, our rescue, our shield and our place of safety. You are the everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth. And you do not faint nor grow weary. Your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts higher than ours. You are perfect and holy, merciful and slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness and so forgiving. So we take a moment to confess to you and to receive your forgiveness. We thank you for this day, for this moment. It's time to worship. This moment is yours, a gift well made. Thank you that we can be amongst family as we meet together in the warmth of your embrace. The world is uncertain, but your promises remain true. Thank you that we can bring to your feet all that troubles us and leave it there. Strengthen us as we worship you today. Help us draw near to you so that we are transported from a world of concerns and fear to a place where we can be at peace in your presence. So we thank you, God, for this opportunity to meet with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our readings this morning are taken from 1 Peter chapter 4, reading the first 10 verses. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead so that they may be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according in to God with regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled, so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And the gospel reading this morning is taken from John chapter 14, reading from verses 15 to 27. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, but it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will continue to come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. May God add his blessing to his word this morning and may his name be praised. Be excited and encouraged this morning 
because his presence and his peace is always with us. So I encourage you not to let the unknown become a source of fear. When the disciples faced the unknown, which was a future without Jesus, Jesus comforted them and calmed their fears by telling them that he, he would promise them his spirit. He said his spirit will live in them and by his spirit he will be with them. His presence and his peace with us. In fact, when John begins chapter 14 and verse 1, he records the words of Jesus, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And he says to them, I'm going to send my spirit. What are some of the truths about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, we know, is the very presence of God within us as believers. Some of the truths are in chapter 14 of John's Gospel and verse 16, that he will be with us forever. The world cannot accept him. He lives with you and will be in you. And he will teach you all things. And what is more, the Holy Spirit will give you peace. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. He also continues to say, it's unlike worldly peace. He says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Because the peace that he gives is a confident assurance that we have in any circumstance. With the peace of Christ, we don't need to fear the future nor the present. We all wish we knew the future so that we can prepare for it. But God has, in his wisdom, chosen to not give us this knowledge. He alone knows what will happen today and tomorrow. However, he tells us that in order to cope with the present and in order to cope with the future, we must never forget that he will never leave us. He tells us that in order to cope with the present and the future, he will be in us. And so God knows what will happen and he will be with us through it all. And that is why we need not to let our hearts be troubled and not be afraid. When we have faith in God, we can be secure about the future. There's so much war often going on within us. Sin, fear, uncertainty, doubt, and numerous other forces that are at war constantly within us, let alone the forces at war in the world right now, COVID-19 being only but one of them. It is the peace of God that moves into our hearts and lives there to restrain these hostile forces and to offer comfort in the place of conflict. And Jesus says he will give us peace if we are willing to accept it from him. So God calls us this morning again to walk in his peace. In the midst of every season of our lives, John 14 and verse 27 applies. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We are called to walk in his peace, not add our voices to the world's chaos. You're not entering this new era alone. Not only has God offered you his peace, but he's with us and he's gone before us. None of this pandemic, the quarantine, the post-quarantine period, none of it has caught God by surprise. He has a plan ready and waiting for his church. So we find ourselves in a season of change and the church will have to adapt and to adjust to the season of change in ways that it has never seen before. We cannot enter this post quarantine period or era, whatever you want to call it, with a business as usual mentality. This pandemic has been a wake up call like none other. This is an opportunity to make the necessary positive changes to move our church forward. So we need to be ready to begin this new journey. I wonder if you remember that game that we all used to play with our, with our hands as kids. We used to say, here is the church, and here is the steeple, and if you open the doors inside, you see all the people. And then came Corona, and some people insisted that we no longer speak about going to church. They said the people are the church, and they don't go to the church. Okay, so the church is not a building, and the building is not the church, but the church facility is the place where the church gathers. And this may be a building like we are privileged to have, or it may be a tree, or it may be a house. But it's the place where the church gathers. And the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 24 wants members to gather to motivate and to encourage one another. 
He's explicit in his letter, this writer, in this desire and hope. He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And so how do we do this? Well, the very next verse tells us we don't give up meeting together. as Some are in the habit of doing. But we encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As you see the day approaching. As fellow believers, we are called to encourage one another when we meet together. And so the gathered church is important. Indeed, during the pandemic, we missed the in-person gathering of the church. And this morning, for the first time, we gather in person in this congregation. We have a new opportunity before us. We have seen the church can survive and even thrive in the midst of world crisis. So what is not changing in this post-quarantine church? Well, the Bible still remains the word of God. Christ is still the only way of salvation. Prayer remains critical and vital to our existence. Evangelism is still a mandate given to us by Jesus. God remains sovereign over the chaos of our world and he will always reign. God's sovereignty doesn't always make sense to us. But the truth of God's sovereignty should serve to remind us and that the world will never spin out under God's control. We return to Isaiah's vision of God high and lifted up. Our holy God, as Isaiah saw him, high and almighty, who is not surprised when the world rages in turmoil. He remains holy. He alone is worthy. He alone rules over all. What remains the same in this post-quarantine church is that the God we serve is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And what remains the same is we have his peace and his spirit within us. However, change is coming at a pace for leaders and members of the church. You can only but imagine how the first century, century Christians felt as they were trying to reach a world that needed to hear the good news of the resurrected Savior. We could only imagine their excitement and their fear as they entered a new era. They knew the path ahead would be difficult. They knew it would be dangerous. But they also knew their efforts would be worth the cost. And so we, as, as we enter an unknown era, we are uncertain of the specifics of what will unfold. But we remain certain that God, in all of his wisdom, and the God of all power, will be with us every step of the way, offering his peace and his presence. Jesus gave the, his disciples the Great Commission. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He reminded them that they were not going it alone. I am with you always to the very end of the age with my peace and my presence. And with the same assurance we enter this new era, this new season of opportunity. With the same promise we lead our church into the future. And with the same confidence we know that we will not be alone regardless of what unfolds. And when all is said and done, nothing else really matters other than he will never leave us and never forsake us. Jesus promised his disciples that when he leaves and things would be uncertain, he promised them the counselor, the advocate, the Holy Spirit to be with them, to give them peace. So they need not be troubled and they need not to be afraid. So the Holy Spirit is Jesus' presence in our lives, his presence that will never leave us, never forsake us. Secondly, this morning, now that we have discussed his peace and his presence, I want to remind you of a, of a statement that Winston Churchill made. He said, never let a good crisis go to waste. He said this in the, in the middle of the 1940s in reference to the conditions post the Second World War that allowed for the formation of the United Nations. The word crisis is composed of two characters, one representing danger and the other opportunity. As a leadership team of this church, we don't want a good crisis to go to waste. It may just be possible that the church will change more in one year than it has in the last 50 years. This year has shown us that we need to reinvent the church as we knew it. And the big question is, how will it change? And the answer is, we don't know. The truth is that we're all, we're all over the world figuring this out together. We desperately probably want to go back to the way things were. And that's the choice most of us would probably make, but that's not an option. It's actually not a choice that any of us can make. We've all said, I just can't wait for things to get back to normal. 
But as the COVID-19 crisis moves into its seventh month in this country with no real end in sight, we have to accept that the church as we knew it has changed significantly. We cannot go back. We can only go forward. We have an opportunity now to go forward. We want to embrace the many lessons learned and we want to forge into the future with renewed passion and determination. During lockdown, who would believe that we planted a second congregation, an online one? We would never in our wildest dreams have thought that we would even plant a church. And so we don't want to let a good crisis go to waste. And so we are committed to maintaining church online. In Peter's letter, he saw a crisis as an opportunity for good. When he wrote his letter that I read earlier this morning, he was writing to a people living in very dark times. The church was being persecuted. Hardship was intense. Jerusalem would soon be burnt to the ground. And I'm sure in those days they were saying, saying things like, we have said, well, why can't things just return to normal? So what did Peter do in this crisis moment? He did a couple of things. He said, with this hardship that we are facing, he's going to use it as an opportunity to focus on the eternal. He said in 1 Peter 1 verse 13, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Focus on the eternal in a crisis moment. The hardship they faced would be an opportunity to become like Christ. And so a question to us this morning is, how is God shaping your character in this current crisis? 1 Peter 4 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. What is Jesus changing in you? Thirdly, the hardships they faced would be an opportunity to pray intensely, drawing near to the heart of God and growing daily in dependence on him. And so would you say that your prayer life has strengthened during this crisis? 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, he wrote, Therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. That's what he did in a crisis, focused on the eternal, looked at his character to become more like Christ, and he prayed. Fourthly, the hardship they faced would be an opportunity to love extravagantly. They could extend grace. They could be kind. He says in 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. We need to do the same if we haven't done that in a crisis. Love each other deeply. He also said to them, Well, the hardships that you're facing could be an opportunity for generosity. You could meet the needs of others with food. Have we been generous enough during this crisis? And Peter 4 and verse 9 says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. The crisis creates opportunity. The hardship they face would be an opportunity to see who they were and what they had as a gift from God to bless others through service. As a church, are we using everyone's talents and ability to meet this moment? How can we serve better? 1 Peter 4 and verse 10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have to receive to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace, God's grace in its various forms. Have you served? Can you still serve in the crisis? Has it created that opportunity for you? And lastly, the hardships they faced would be an opportunity to share with others the hope they had in Christ. The worse the crisis gets, the more hope stands out. Do those that you encounter see hope in you? 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so there are some lessons from Peter, from Winston Churchill, to never let a good crisis go to waste. Thirdly this morning, to make a statement if life gives you a pile of dung, dance with it. It's actually called the dance of the dung beetle. In South Africa, we have 800 species of dung beetles. And according to dung beetles, dung is pretty good and useful. Dung beetles eat dung. They are grown completely in a ball of dung. Dung beetles are beetles that feed on feces. They form a bit of dung into, into a ball. They roll it along. They roll it away. They bury it. They walk backwards as they roll this little ball of dung along the ground. It really is a bizarre way to transport your food. Females lay their eggs in that dung, or they use it as a food source. You can imagine that in Africa, 
as they roll that ball of dung through the, the fields and the felt, it gets really hot. So how do they deal with the heat? Well, the dung beetle dances. He does a little dance or she does a little dance on top of the ball to deal with the heat. They climb on top of the ball. They take a look at the world around them. They look at the sun when they're on top of the ball. And this helps them to direct their movements. They do a little dance on top of the ball to then get their direction. If they're going in the wrong direction, they do another little dance and they turn around and they head back in the right direction. And so this dance allows them to reorientate themselves as well. They also dance for another reason. In the heat of summer, when they get onto the top of the ball, they wipe their faces down to try and cool themselves. When the ground is hot, they dance more often. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul wrote these words to the church in Corinth that also was under threat. He encouraged them that despite all their difficulties, they would not be destroyed. In fact, Paul encouraged them to make the best out of a bad situation. And so when life gives you dung, dance with it. Somehow, like the dung beetle, we have to get on top of it. We have to look up. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in the right direction, the God-given direction. A direction in which we are not crushed, not in despair, never abandoned and not destroyed. Lastly, this morning, we believe in a God who can turn things around. We serve a God who can turn things around within an instant because he is God of the resurrection. And his resurrection power lives and dwells within each one of us through his spirit. Throughout history, he has done wonders and miracles. He has turned people's lives around. He has turned nations around. He has moved in power as the gospel has been proclaimed. He has built his church and the gates of hell have not and will not prevail ever against it and so we continue this journey with his peace and his presence amen let us pray together thank you for giving us the strength to endure thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us and thank you for not letting us give up when our situation seemed out of control thank you for picking us up when we were knocked down god continue to give us hope thank you for building your church and for places of worship. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this morning. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen.